Hi, it's good to see everybody. Oh, new people. Wow, this is exciting. So let me introduce, this is, my name is Terry Helton, and my husband is Tim Helton. You already met him. He's muted himself. We are the co-chairs of the Ventura County Interfaith Community. We've been doing this since 2006, and um, we've had the Feast of Faiths for 11 of those years, and this year we decided we couldn't do that because it's just not safe, no matter what you're seeing on TV tonight, and um, that we couldn't do the Feast of Faith this year. And we sent out a survey saying, what would people like to do? And we came back with two options, and so we decided to alternate them. Last month, we did the meaning of life, um, and we had Michael Lotker, who was the moderator and speaker for Judy, uh, moderator, but he was also the speaker for Judaism, and uh, Trinitarian Christianity was Janice, um, oh, my Dario. God, thank you, Dario, and then we also had uh, the Baha'i, and that was Arash Payan, um, and so this month, we want to focus on one faith, and that happens to be uh, Soka Gagai Mitram Buddhism, and uh, Mick Walsh will be speaking tonight, and I have here a little bit to say about him as we get started. So Mick Walsh is, a man, is the man's leader for SGI USA's Gold Coast region, which encompasses Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo counties, with 17 local branches or districts. He began practicing Soka Gagai Mitra Buddhism over 40 years ago in Seattle, where he served as a youth leader. Mick earned a bachelor's and master's degree at the University of Washington. He and his wife live in Simi Valley and have two adult children. Now retired, he, is an, he was an executive with the North American Division of Major European Security Services Provider, where he managed corporate pensions, employee benefits, and pay practices. And we are glad to hear him speak tonight, but we are also sad that we're going to be losing him as a speaker as he will explain. Right, thank you very much, Terry, for that nice introduction. Um, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining tonight. Yes, I am um, uh, going to be moving, or actually have moved already to a new role within our SGI group, um, focused more in the Simi Valley um, and uh, northern part of the San Fernando Valley. And so my good friend, uh, Scott Wilson, who is on the call, uh, is going to be um, uh, the leader for uh, the Gold Coast region. So I've enjoyed presenting uh, to this uh, organization over the years, um, and I'm sure that uh, Scott will try to pick up and, and uh, you know, carry, carry that, uh, that ball forward. Um, and I'd like to thank each of you who is attending tonight. I know there are other things you could be watching or doing, so I'm really grateful that you're here. Um, and um, the uh, practice that we do, Soka Gakkai Nichiren in Buddhism, may be a little bit different than some of the faiths that you're used to. Um, and uh, so um, let's get started. Um, let's go to the next slide. And we'll talk about Buddhism in general. It is one of the world's oldest major religions, uh, dating from the 5th century BCE. It was founded in India by the Buddha, um, also known as Shakyamuni or Siddhartha. Um, the teachings of Buddhism were transmitted orally for several centuries, and they were finally put in written form beginning in about the 1st century BCE, before Common Era, and uh, the 1st century of the Common Era. Next slide, please. So let's talk about Buddhists. What kind of people are Buddhists? Um, there are Asian societies in which Buddhism is very deeply ingrained part of the culture. Um, these are generally broken up into what are known as Southern and Northern Buddhism. Southern corresponds to the Theravada branch. Uh, Northern corresponds to the Mahayana branch. Um, and so Southern we find in Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Cambodia, Thailand, and Laos. Uh, the Northern version we find in China, the Tibet Autonomous Region. Nepal and Bhutan, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. Outside of Asia, we find um, Buddhism practiced within diaspora communities and increasingly among non-Asians. Um, this might be through uh, marriage, through family affiliation, or people being attracted to the philosophy and practices of Buddhism. Um, 
Many of the people in the West, though, um, are kind of turned off, I would say, by the uh, cultural baggage that comes along with many of the traditional forms of Buddhism. Um, there are a lot of culturally specific elements that you'll find in most practices. And so they will tend to kind of strip out everything that seems like it's uh, other than a meditative type practice. And so we find that focus on what is now called mindfulness meditation. Uh, those practices typically come from Vipassana, Zen, or Tibetan um, meditative practices. Um, and um, this has left us in a situation where it's not even clear to many people if Buddhism is even a religion, um, or if it is a religion, what qualifies as Buddhism. So next slide, please. For me, I think the best way to look at Buddhism as a religion is to do it on a comparative basis. When we look at it in relation to other religions, um, we can see that it does have aspects that, that I think most people would consider uh, religious. Um, I certainly will make the case that it is a religion. Um, and regarding the second of those questions I had, I would suggest that um, all strands that identify as Buddhism, I believe should be considered Buddhist. Um, and that would be comparable within Christianity. You have many ways of being Christian, um, but um, all of them fall under the big umbrella of, of the Christian faith. So I would say that the same would hold for Buddhism. Um, so th this is a way of thinking about it that I find helpful. Um, all of the major religions seem to talk, talk about these four uh, dualities or, or um, um, uh, dichotomies that are listed here, good versus evil, purity versus impurity, order versus chaos, um, enlightenment or truth versus delusion or falsehood. And what is uh, a difference is the emphasis in each one of the traditions. So Buddhism, Buddhism has teachings on each one of these dichotomies, although uh, Buddhism in general rejects dualism. It emphasizes instead what is called the middle path. Um, but I'll give you one example from um, one of our publications that talks about a different way of thinking about good and evil. Um, so it says, quote, that which creates trust, respect, and harmony among people can be described as good. That which divides people causing disrespect and mistrust is regarded as evil, end quote. So even though enlightenment versus delusion is primary, there are still uh, teachings or discussions about uh, these other things. And uh, just a way to try to visualize this um, would be on the next slide, um, uh, display the religions, major religions on a spectrum. And this is a personal opinion. This is not official Buddhist doctrine, but um, just a way to, to think about it. So Hinduism, and I won't go into the reasons for these, but Hinduism tends to uh, emphasize pure versus defiled. Buddhism, of course, enlightened versus deluded. Um, Taoism and Confucianism talk about order versus chaos. They describe it in much different terms, but that still seems to be their underlying thrust. Uh, Zoroastrianism sort of sits on the boundary um, between order versus chaos and good versus evil. And then the Abrahamic religions in general um, have the emphasis of good versus uh, evil. Uh, next slide, please. So um, let's move on to SGI and what its particular take on Buddhism is. The practice itself was established by a priest named Nichiren in 13th century Japan. Um, the Soka Gakkai or SGI is a religious lay organization founded in 1930. It serves as a global umbrella with local organizations and informal networks throughout the world. Um, it's currently in 192 countries and territories. Um, not all of those are officially organized. It depends on the laws of each, each location. Um, we do a daily practice on an individual or family basis. Um, so that's done at home. And then we also do group activities as well. And our group activities typically take the form of what are called uh, discussion meetings. They're a smaller scale meeting, maybe 10 to 15 people, um, frequently in people's homes. And that is our primary format for gathering. So I'd like you to kind of join with me on a little imaginary uh, journey here. Um, imagine that someone you know invites you to an SGI discussion meeting. And we're going to have that experience by watching a video which Tim is kindly going to run for us called Introduction to SGI Nature and Buddhism. So Tim, let's go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Each of us has a powerful song of courage, wisdom, and compassion. To awaken to this reality of our lives is the essence of Buddhism. And this brilliance lies within all of us. Ah! Why aren't you turning off? No, no! No, no, no! Let's do this. Hello? An hour? What was I thinking? Tacos for breakfast? Right, right, right. Okay. No, I got you. I got you. Oh, really? Ow! I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to school. Sweetie, you're going to school. I made your favorite lunch. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Okay, buddy, time to take the mask off. Look, you're just as powerful without it. Thanks, Dad. Hey, Dad! Dad, my college girl is back home! Hey! <laughs> Smells great! Uh, yeah, okay. Loneliness, conflict, and illness. These are not unique to our present times, but are as old as life itself. You know what? That almost tasted like mom's spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. How have you been doing, Dad? Who, me? What? Are you worried about your old man? Come on. I've been fine. I need you to finish that presentation. I don't care how long you have to stay to get it done. Understood? Yes. Yes, sir. Of course. All right. Thank you very much. I will talk to you soon. Okay, talk. Hello? Hello? Hi, is this Isabel? Yes, hi, how are you? Just wanted to let you know. We appreciate you coming down, but we went with another cellist. Okay. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Too often we struggle to truly believe in ourselves. These feelings of fear and anxiety stem from our belief that we are not good enough, not strong enough to overcome life's storms. I miss her. Me too. Buddhism began as a quest to overcome these essential problems of life. Shakyamuni, or Siddhartha Gautama, as he is also known, was a prince in a small province in northern India. He lived in comfort and luxury. But one day, he ventured outside of his palace gates. He saw hunger, sickness, and poverty. Witnessing this made him feel ashamed of his life of excess and luxury. He determined to find a path that would allow people to overcome these essential sufferings of life. He tried many different spiritual paths, meditation, fasting, living in isolation, even extreme practices such as sleeping on a bed of thorns and on bones in a cemetery. But Shakyamuni realized that these kinds of practices did not bring him what he was looking for. Shakyamuni then came upon a tree he sat underneath this large Bodhi tree and meditated, determined to find an answer. Strong winds blew. He felt as if demons were attacking him. He worried this too was another futile path, but refused to give up as the storm raged on. And at last, he saw these demons for what they were, his own negativity and fear. Finally, he was able to attain enlightenment and perceive the law or principle that pervades the entire universe and all living beings. Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. All living beings are endowed with courage, wisdom, and compassion. He then began sharing this knowledge with others. Disciples emerged and sought to understand and follow this revolutionary new way of life. Shakyamuni poured the essence of all his teachings into the Lotus Sutra which radically declared that all people are equal 
and the purpose of life is happiness. After his death, the true teaching became diluted and fractured into many different sects. Shakyamuni even came to be revered as a god and not a human being. Nichiren Daishonin was born in Japan to a family of modest fishermen. As he grew up, he saw his country ripped apart by natural disasters, epidemics, and conflict. He asked himself, why is this happening? To put an end to this suffering, Nichiren vowed to become the wisest person of Japan. He diligently studied all schools of Buddhism. After many years, he came to realize the Lotus Sutra is the highest teaching of Buddhism because it taught women, men, and all living beings are equal and endowed with Buddhahood. This is the law of nam myoho renge kyo By chanting and awakening to it, anyone can call forth their greatest self and win over life suffering. Nichiren stood up alone and went on his own epic quest to spread this law of nam myoho renge kyo But as Nichiren Buddhism grew, the political and religious establishment saw his teachings of empowerment and equality as a threat. They persecuted him and exiled him to a small snowy island in the Japan Sea. However, with the strength he found from chanting nam myoho renge kyo he felt the persecution signaled his mission to empower all people with the teachings of Buddhism. Stating, All obstacles are no more than dust before the wind. Nichiren inscribed the Gohonzon which is the scroll we chant to because it depicts the Buddhahood within all living beings. One by one, he helped people use Buddhism to awaken to their great strength and courage. His disciples overcame illness, poverty, and family strife to lead lives of victory. And in current times, it is the Soka Gakkai that emerged as a movement of ordinary people who have used Nichiren's teachings to conquer life's challenges. They are the organization to spread the Lotus Sutra and Nichiren's Buddhism correctly based on the equality and great potential of all people. Today, due to the lion-hearted efforts of the three founding presidents and eternal mentors, Sunesaburo Makaguchi, Jose Toda, and Daisaku Ikeda, to spread this Buddhism, people all around the world chant the law of nam myoho renge kyo as taught by Nichiren to awaken to the same indomitable life state of Buddhahood, to see the dignity of their lives and others, to overcome all difficulties and problems with a sense of mission to inspire all. Our mentor, Daisaku Ikeda, Buddhist philosopher and president of the Soka Gakkai International shares, chanting nam myoho renge kyo is a struggle to return to our true, original selves and tap the innate life force that we have possessed from time without beginning. There are times in our life where each of us has brought forth the courage to stand up for ourselves or to have compassion for someone who is suffering. Buddhists call the great potential for these qualities within life Buddhahood. Bringing this out every day, though, is very difficult. Just as math and chemistry equations such as E equals MC squared or H2O describe laws of nature, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo expresses the universal law that the condition of Buddhahood exists within all living beings and in our environment. The perseverance of a flower to bloom amid cold winds. An ecosystem maintains a delicate balance so it may sustain the life within it. This innate, compassionate, courageous energy of the universe to advance and protect life is the law of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. To chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is to harness this great energy and to use it to overcome adversity and create a better world. It is not, however, a magic formula. Instead, when we chant, we enact a revolution in our lives. We fight against our deep-seated negativity, our fundamental disbelief in ourselves, and open our eyes to the reserves of courage, wisdom, and compassion within us. SGI Buddhists call this process human revolution. In other words, <coughs> we chant and become the solution to our problems. Finding the courage to open a new chapter in life. Thanks for babysitting, Dad. Oh, no problem. Hey, look, 
Take your time. I can hang here with my little man all day. <laughs> Summoning the spirit to never be defeated. Developing a heart of appreciation, even after a really tough day. Buddhism is also about digging into the earth of our daily life in our communities. An expression of this is SGI's neighborhood discussion rooms. Here, people from every background dialogue with one another and share their real life experiences with Buddhism. Based on the belief in the equality of all people, SGI also does not have priests or clergy. Rather, SGI Buddhists support each other as equals, encouraging one another to achieve their dreams and bring peace to their communities. The key to all change is in our inner transformation, a change of our hearts and minds. This is human revolution. We all have the power to change. When we realize this truth, we can bring forth that power anywhere, anytime, and in any situation. Because when we change, the world changes. Thank you, Tim, for, uh, for running that. We go to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, hopefully everyone now has a, at least some sense of the history of Buddhism and uh, a little bit of a sense of what the SGI is about. Um, some people have viewed uh, Buddhism as a life denying religion. I hope that you see from that video that that is not what the SGI is about. But suffering is a big topic in Buddhism, um, and uh, so I think it's one that we should at least address briefly. Um, it's viewed as a natural part of life, and that that was the initial teaching of the Buddha, was how do we uh, overcome suffering? Um, life has birth, aging, sickness, and death. Those are the traditional four sufferings that we all face, no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how successful you are. Those are things that we still go through. Um, the term for suffering in uh, Pali, which is the language of the early Buddhist text that was spoken in India around the time of the Buddha, um, the word is dukkha, and it does include what we think of as suffering in terms of, of pain and misery, but in the broadest sense, the word um, more or less equates to what we might call unsatisfactory, and this is really a very simple insight. And that is that life is never as fulfilling as we might wish. Um, we want sometimes things that we don't have. We want to avoid things that we uh, dislike. <coughs> so these are all things that we, we struggle with actually on a day-by-day -day basis. Buddhism explains that suffering arises from misguided views about and distorted interactions with the reality around us. And that reality, of course, uh, includes other people. Um, you may have heard the, the uh, expression before, hell is other people. That's not a Buddhist uh, viewpoint, but it still kind of gets to the idea that um, if we don't 
wisely interact with others and with our environment, we will invite suffering. Um, and Buddhism sort of summarizes the major internal causes of suffering as what are called the three poisons, greed, hatred, and ignorance. These are seen to be at the root of, of all suffering, really. And the question is, how do we challenge or confront them or transform them? Life didn't come with an instruction manual. And that is the purpose of Buddhism, is to sort of give us that instruction manual on how to overcome these inner negative tendencies. Next slide, please. So we do that through the process of awakening. Um, SGI describes it as human revolution, which was mentioned in the video. Uh, but the idea of Buddhist practice is that it activates a, a fuller or complete understanding of our own life. And the idea of an awakened life state is that it manifests wisdom, joy, and compassion. These are viewed as being um, integral to the, the human being if we, if we bring them out. And that is the equivalent of what we call Buddhahood or enlightenment. The Buddha's message was one of engagement with the world while recognizing the dependence or interconnectedness of all things, their non-dualism and their transience. Um, there's a new Netflix series out, I don't know if anyone has seen it, on uh, connections, and it kind of gets at this from a, a, a little bit different uh, entertainment-based perspective, but, but the idea is there. There is no unchanging or independent nature, um, and that's our tendency is to cling to those ideas of a nature or an identity but it actually does not exist apart from our environment or apart from others. Uh, the terms in Buddhism, dependent, co-arising, and non-substantiality um, are ways of trying to get at this, um, this concept. And I'd like to read just a short uh, quote from Daisaku Ikeda, who was mentioned in that video. Uh, this is from a speech he gave at Harvard University in 1993. Quote, no person or thing exists in isolation. Every being functions to create the environment that sustains all other existences. All things are mutually supported and interrelated, forming a living cosmos, what modern philosophy might term a semantic whole. That is the conceptual framework through which Mahayana Buddhism views the natural universe." End quote. Next slide, please. Um, so formality is a topic that I, I think should be addressed. Um, it's not, of course, unique to Buddhism. And in the comments that I'm going to share, I don't mean any um, criticism or um, uh, 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 disparagement of any, any faiths that do rely heavily on uh, clerical establishments, priests, um, monastic institutions, and so on. Um, I, I, what I'm describing here, these developments are important um, because... Um, Buddhism is so closely aligned in most people's minds with, with monks or, or Buddhist priests that it may be hard to understand how a lay organization like the SGI can function without the involvement of, of clergy. So the, um, because Buddhism was written down centuries after the Buddha's lifetime, there is a lot of dispute about what the original uh, teaching of Buddhism actually looked like. Um, but scholars that look at this believe that the Buddha generally did teach a non-dogmatic uh, religion and that he did it through dialogue. Um, he preached uh, to people by engaging them in dialogue and helped them be a participant in their own self-reformation. But that, that approach seems to have been reshaped within one or two centuries um, following the Buddha's death by monasticism, we see the arising of temples, of uh, different Buddhist sects, priestly lineages. Uh, the doctrines became more and more obscure and um, argumentation became an art form within Buddhism. Um, so these developments within a couple of centuries after the Buddha's uh, passing led to something like 18 early sectarian schools of Buddhism. And um, shortly thereafter, the emergence of the Mahayana branch of Buddhism as a reform movement. So as was mentioned in that video, by the 13th century CE um, in Japan, especially where Nichiren lived, uh, Buddhism had fractured along sectarian lines. Um, each nation had a completely independent uh, clerical uh, set of clerical establishments. And Buddhism, in fact, had died out in India by this time. So it really um, was not anything like the early version of the religion. Um, and in many lands, as was illustrated in that video, um, senior uh, prelates 
competed for prestige and wealth and uh, collaborated with feudal elites to main, uh, maintain status quo authorities. Um, so once again, not unique to Buddhism, but this is something that uh, really differed from what the Buddha's original yeah, message likely was. Uh, next slide, please. So Nichiren's quest, he was faced with this reality. He entered the priesthood to uh, find the solution to unhappiness um, and um, how to reform, uh, re reform his society in a sense. Um, and uh, he asked, what is the purpose of Buddhist practice? What is nirvana? What are all of these basic concepts of Buddhism really trying to get at? And I think nirvana provides a good um, illustration of how the Buddhist uh, groups went in different ways. Um, because the sectarian Buddhists, those 18 early traditions, they held that nirvana is the cessation of rebirths, that the goal of Buddhist practice is to never be born into this world again. Um, and that is still the Theravada Buddhist uh, view. It's actually not clear that the Buddha taught things like reincarnation um, or other things related to that. Uh, there are conflicting um, um, versions or accounts in some of the early Buddhist texts. The Mahayana Buddhists who started out as a reform movement countered that Nirvana is actually life in this world as experienced by a Buddha. And uh, the famous uh, Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna is a uh, um, uh, sort of characteristic of this viewpoint. What this means is that you do not need to go somewhere else or become someone else in order to awaken Buddhahood. It isn't a destination apart from something in your own life. And Nichiren committed to this path. He committed to returning Buddhism to its original purpose, which is human happiness and engagement with the world. And I'd like to share just a brief um, uh, passage from the Lotus Sutra, a very important Buddhist scripture that touches on these, uh, these concepts. It says, the Buddhist, quote, the Buddha perceives the true aspect of the world exactly as it is. There is no ebb or flow of birth and death. There is no existing in this world and later entering nirvana. It is neither substantial nor empty, neither consistent nor diverse, nor is it what those who dwell in the world perceive it to be. Next slide, please. Tim, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go back. I'm sorry. I missed it. Okay, so after Nichiren, um, his teachings as well uh, ended up splitting into uh, various sects, all within Japan. Um, and then beginning in the 17th century, uh, for nearly 250 years, uh, Japan, uh, uh, Japan or the Japanese government prohibited changing religions or leaving one's birth temple. This was the, the Edo period um, in Japanese history. And this uh, action was basically taken to stamp out foreign influences. During the uh, 16th century, the Japanese were trading with the Portuguese and to some extent the Dutch. Um, they got new ideas, they got new weapons, and um, they realized that they didn't want that uh, influence in their country. So they completely shut everything down other than a small uh, trading depot that they had. Um, and uh, part of it was also to stamp out Christianity and uh, to exercise social control over the populace. But as a result of this uh, action, um, the Japanese Buddhist sects became somewhat moribund. Um, they focused heavily on rituals, funerals which became a big part of the emphasis of their um, activities. This legacy carries on even until the present. Um, an example of this is that people in Japan who change their religions can be barred from their traditional family cemetery plots. Um, I, I know that this has happened traditionally in some other religions as well, um, but that is something that's kind of viewed as being out of sync with our, our modern norms about um, uh, treating people with equality. Next slide, please. Soka Gakkai emerged. This was touched on a little bit in the video. Um, Soka Gakkai means value creation society, and it began as a, a, a group of educators. Uh, prior to World War II, um, Japan's government officially established a version of Shintoism, um, generally called state Shinto, um, with the emperor viewed as a living god. Um, they could not, uh, Japanese people could not look at him, they could not hear his voice, um, and that became the official religion. As the um, uh, war intensified, 
Uh, the Buddhist sects in Japan were generally co-opted into serving the war effort. They were all um, uh, placed um, in a subservient role to the state, official state religion of Shintoism. Soka Gakkai itself was founded in 1930 by Tsunesaburo Makaguchi, who was mentioned in that video. He was an educational reformer. And he converted to a sect of Nichiren Buddhism because he saw in Nichiren's teachings a way to bring about a revitalization of society. He and his a disciple, Jose Toto, were imprisoned during the war as thought criminals for opposing government policy. Makaguchi died in prison and Toto was released in July of 1945. That was about a month before the war's end. Um, as I'm sure you, most of you know, that uh, was just uh, commemorated the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II on August 15th. Um, next slide, please. That actually tied very much into the growth of Soka Gakkai because Japan gained religious freedom for the first time by way of the US occupation reforms. Uh, Toto recognized it was an unprecedented opportunity. He launched an effort to revitalize uh, war-torn country through emphasizing the beneficial aspects of Nichiren Buddhist practice. Soka Gakkai embraced Nichiren's ideal of realizing worldwide peace and happiness based on respect for life and human dignity. It became the largest Buddhist denomination in Japan during the 1960s under the leadership of its third president, Daisaku Ikeda. And from that time forward, it began to sponsor wide ranging efforts in the realms of peace, culture and education. Um, in a sense, Soka Gakkai reactivated Buddhism's original social, uh, social message. Next slide, please. So the SGI or Soka Gakkai International um, uh, was born um, uh, not too long after that. Soka Gakkai began to expand globally during the 1960s. The first um, um, members in America started appearing in the late 1950s and early 1960s. The SGI was established in 1975 on the island, island of Guam. There were 52 nations that participated or members or representatives from 52 nations that participated. Uh, today, the SGI has 10 million members in Japan and 2 million in other nations. It is the largest Buddhist denomination in many non-Buddhist countries in Europe, the Americas and Africa. And it is the largest Buddhist denomination in Japan as well. In 1991, it separated from its former sectarian relationship. Um, so since that time, we have had no formal relationship with any uh, clerical establishment um, within the Buddhist uh, tradition. And in 2014, the SGI established Soka Gakkai Nichiren Buddhism as an independent denomination. Next slide, please. And just a few comments about Daisaku Ikeda. Um, he's 92 years old, so he is uh, elderly, but he remains the honorary president of the SGI. He has published over his lifetime many dialogues with various officials, artists, and scholars. Uh, just a few examples, uh, jazz musician Herbie Hancock, who is also an SGI member, um, has published a dialogue with him. Uh, David Krieger, um, he uh, is uh, based in Santa Barbara. He founded a anti-nuclear foundation. Um, he has published a dialogue with Daisaku Ikeda. He's also participated um, in some of our um, local events uh, that were sponsored by SGI. Um, uh, politicians well-known such as Nelson Mandela of South Africa, Mikhail Gorbachev of the former Soviet Union, uh, Sonia Gandhi of India, um, and then uh, many scholars including Arnold Toynbee, a famous uh, historian, um, all, all published dialogues together with Daisaku Ikeda. He has offered annual peace proposals since the 1980s to the United Nations. He's received nearly 400 academic awards from around the globe from a global, ins, uh, global list of institutions. Uh, he founded Soka University, the Soka School System, cultural and research institutes and publications about Buddhism and peace. Uh, there is a Soka University of America in Orange County. It was established in 2000 um, and is uh, quickly um, um, being recognized as a um, uh, 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 a high quality uh, liberal arts uh, institution within the United States. Daisaku Ikeda is viewed by many SGI members as a life mentor who has helped revive Nichiren Buddhism as a living religion in the modern era. Next slide, please. So that concludes uh, what I wanted to share. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Um, Terry, do you wanna take over?
My apologies for not telling you you could chat, put in the chat your questions. So does anybody have any questions at this time? Ah, Mike has a question. How would you make define Buddhahood? Uh, excellent question. So in our form of Buddhism, we define it as a life condition. It is not an intellectual achievement, um, but rather a life condition. Um, there's a theory that's called the uh, 10 life conditions or 10 states of existence, uh, ranging from hell at the lowest level, not as a place to go, but as a uh, something that you experience in life. A uh, condition of hell is one of absolute misery. You want to destroy yourself. You want to destroy others around you. So people that uh, commit um, uh, murder, acts of violence, um, uh, commit suicide, um, we would say that their life is, is uh, dominated by this life condition of hell. And then progressively more energetic, more uh, value creating life uh, conditions. Um, or we consider the world of humanity, the, the normal calm state of human beings, the world of rapture is one of you know, a joyful feeling when you fulfill a goal or, or achieve a, a, a long-held uh, idea. Uh, we, uh, going up to the ninth world, that's bodhisattva. That's the spirit to extend your life to help other people. And then Buddhahood um, is considered one that you can't actually uh, derive through um, comparing to things like, you know, a doctor that's helping sick people might be acting in the world of bodhisattva, but rather a Buddhahood is characterized as a life condition filled with um, complete joy. Um, we call it absolute happiness, the kind of happiness that does not depend on external circumstances, but derives from within your life itself. It's characterized as one of compassion, joy, um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, wisdom, um, you know, knowing how to make the right, uh, right choices in life. And so um, it's not a place that you go, but it's a state that you activate through um, uh, in, in Buddhism, you activate it through your Buddhist practice. And it's something that we want to make the dominant uh, condition of our, of our lives. Would Maslow have called that self-actualization? Self you can call it self-actualization, yes. I mean, there are different ways of trying to define it. Um, you know, Buddhism describes it within life condition terms um, and uh, defines a practice to try to help awaken that. So can you... Sorry. Somebody had a question. Whoops, I just lost. Uh, would you describe Buddhahood as a status that you might attain momentarily? Or is this something you achieve and then become? And would it be like 1%, 10%, 48%? Okay, it's a very good question. Yeah, so there, there are a variety of different of types of Buddhism, and many of them define it um, differently. So in some forms of Buddhism, they basically look as Shakyamuni as the only person that ever became a Buddha like a unique individual, the video indicated that he almost became worshipped as a, as a god in some traditions. Um, that isn't what we do. Mahayana Buddhism in general says that all people possess a Buddha nature or Buddha wisdom within, um, but that to realize that they have to engage in practice. So the practice that we do says that in chanting Namyoho Renge Kyo, you actually are, are awakening or fusing with your own Buddha nature in that very moment but we still live in a world where we go through the other nine life conditions. In other words, you'll, you'll chant in the morning and you know, awaken this joyful, optimistic, dynamic life condition within, but then you still have to go out and you know, teach your classes, go to work, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, drive, drive or commute, all of the things that people go through. And so we experience life in the other conditions. Um, but Buddhahood is sort of like becomes the, the anchor in a sense in our life. So I would say that from the perspective of SGI Nietzsche in Buddhism, it would be 100% of people that carry out their Buddhist practice are awakening this condition. But the idea is that we're looking at what Buddhahood is as something that's accessible to and normal for human beings. It does not turn you into a god or a deity or some other supernatural being. So I think Part of what we're talking about is definitional. It's what, what do you think a Buddha is? And if we realize that Buddha is a fully realized, um, um, uh, a, a fully uh, happy and, and um, uh, accomplished human being, then we realize that that, that Buddhahood condition is accessible widely uh, to all people. Um, that is something else unique within um, the uh, Buddhist tradition coming from groups that follow the Lotus Sutra 
um, is that it did not discriminate in terms of who could attain Buddhahood. Many forms of Buddhism would exclude women from Buddhahood, for example. Uh, many forms would exclude people that um, had committed some type of gross evil or were uh, disbelievers in some way. And, and the Lotus Sutra of Buddhism and Nichiren's teaching that's based on that says that all people have that potential, all people can awaken Buddhahood. So um, I hope that helps help answer the question. So that sounds like people of other faiths can work on Buddhahood. See, I, I would say yes. I mean, we consider the Buddhist practice to be um, a big part of it. It is um, a, a transformative process. We do have to challenge our, our illusions, our doubts, our, our misunderstandings, our uh, as I mentioned earlier, our, our mistaken interactions with reality. So I don't want to say that Buddhism says that in general, but it does say that all people possess Buddha nature, that people can tap into that Buddha nature uh, regardless of specific practice. Um, we would say that Buddhism or our Buddhist practice is the most um, effective way to address that and to awaken it consistently. Um, but it does not, that does not deny the um, value or validity of other faiths um, and the fact that, that other people that do not do this practice can also, you know, from time to time or in certain circumstances would be able to tap into that Buddha, um, you know, wisdom uh, as well. Okay. So would you consider yourself a pacifist? Yes, I would. And what about other SGI Buddhas? Uh, okay, so um, no, this is a good question. So um, our our particular practice does not um, carry a, a weight of commandments with it. It does very much emphasize um, respect for human dignity and respect for life. Um, so when it comes to human life, because human beings are um, the the most uh, capable of awakening this this Buddha nature, um, we do not um, condone or support um, any form of violence, um, warfare, et cetera, um, against human beings. I would say that there are exceptions for defending life. So for example, we have um, SGI members who are police officers who are on, in the military. Um, that is part of their role is to um, act in a way to defend life. And so we would say that in that action, um, that would be something that we would consider um, you know, within, within the realm of things that are not um, um, against the spirit of Buddhism. Um, the Buddha said, someone asked him about that once, and he was quoted as stating that it's enough to kill the will to kill. So if, you're, if your actions are done to protect or support life and not out of anger, malice, um, uh, conquest, or things like that, then there may be exceptions to the normal rule of, of nonviolence. But it's only in those very limited cases where um, we would, would tend to make that um, exception. Um, as you saw, the, the first two presidents of this organization ended up in, in jail in Japan um, because they refused to collaborate with uh, government directions that were very much in the direction of, of militarism. They didn't, they didn't have an option. They couldn't do uh, you know, service uh, like a conscientious objector could do in this country, for example. Interesting. So when and how did you join SGI Nichirism? That's okay. a question from one of our other faith members. Great. So um, I um, uh, started practicing this in Seattle in 1974. That's where I'm from. Um, I had first heard of it a few years before that. I had a stepbrother who had begun practicing it. Uh, my stepbrother uh, was a troubled uh, young man. Uh, he was abusing drugs at the age of 12 or 13. Um, and when he started to chant, it was the first time I ever saw him sort of have his, his life together. Um, I attended a meeting with him when I was 16. I learned how to chant. I did it for about a week. Um, but then he never invited me back to another meeting. And so I just sort of um, gave up on it or forgot about it. And um, myself, I was a, was a good student at school, but I started to um, go down some of those same paths. I, I did some fairly negative things. I started to get uh, depressed quite a bit. Um, I started getting more and more isolated from, uh, from others. And I realized I was doing something wrong and I was sort of on a bad path, but I didn't know what the right answer was. And I felt, okay, I'm too much mired in my own worries and concerns. I need to do something maybe to extend myself for others. And so I volunteered 
uh, for a uh, program with the Seattle Parks Department uh, the summer between my freshman and sophomore years in college, uh, working with disabled children. And so I thought maybe that was something I could do that would be helpful to others. And it was at that, um, that camp that I, I met another SGI member. She told me about what she was doing. I said, oh, yes, I know about that. And so I, I went with her to a meeting and I started practicing shortly thereafter. So, uh, so yes, I've been doing this um, uh, consistently for 45 years and began doing it 46 years ago. And um, that's how I got started. And I found that it really did transform many, many things in my life. I am a much different person. I've lived a life, I think, beyond what I could have imagined at that point um, back then, um, you know, having a beautiful family relations, even after, um, you know, uh, my parents divorced when I was four, they, both of my parents remarried, they both had very difficult marriages. Um, I, as I mentioned, I was uh, prone to depression, um, uh, anxiety, other, other turmoils that you know, are common for many young people, but I found that the Buddhist practice really helped me through all of that. Um, and I've, I've had many experiences in life that are really, um, you know, I, I feel that the, the practice was instrumental in transforming for me. Nice. So on that effect, uh, you mentioned the chanting, and we did have a person ask if you could give us a sample of the chanting. Okay, um, sure. So it, it's what was done in that movie. So we recite the phrase Nam Myo Ho Renge Kyo. Um, and so Myo Ho Renge Kyo is the title of the Lotus Sutra. That's a very important scripture in this form of Buddhism. Um, it is the Japanese pronunciation of the a Chinese translation that was originally composed in Sanskrit or another Indian language. Um, and um, it's done the same way throughout the world. Um, it was uh, uh, chanted that way by Nichiren. Um, and um, there is some sort of logic behind it in a way. Uh, Japanese is not a tonal language. Um, so like Chinese or Thai, for example, you actually have to change your pitch in order to convey meaning. So it's very difficult for people that are not from those cultures or language families to be able to chant tonal languages. Um, similarly, um, Sanskrit is an extremely difficult language to pronounce. Um, uh, young Brahmins spend years trying to learn how to pronounce it correctly. Um, but Japanese, I mean, the phrase nam myo ho renge kyo, the, the sounds in it exist in almost all languages. It's very rhythmical. It's a single tone. And so it actually is a very comfortable thing to chant. And you might find that hard to believe hearing it the first time. I know it sounds a little bit odd, um, but once you start doing it, it actually becomes a very natural thing. The vowel sounds are like in Spanish um, and um, all of the sounds that are in it are, are found in English. So, so we basically would recite nam yo ho renge kyo, nam yo ho renge kyo for some period of time. It can be five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. I mean, people do what they would like. Um, we say that it is sort of a, like bridges both prayer and meditation. There is a meditative aspect to it. Um, it, it there is a, a form of meditation called mantra meditation. Nam Yoho Renge Kyo is a mantra. Um, but it also, um, uh, people will use the chant about specific things that they are facing or challenging within their lives. And so that aspect of it is, is prayer-like in a way. So it actually, to me, it sort of bridges uh, both of those concepts, they're not, not maintained separately from each other. Yeah. Um, as you do it, you don't need to think of anything in particular. You basically can clear your mind. You can uh, just think positive thoughts about other people. You can think about specific things that you might need to see um, happen within your life. We don't really put any rules or restrictions or commands on, on what you do and, and how you chant. Um, yes. Can you remind us of what the uh, meaning of the words are? Sure. So, so as I said, it's Nyoho Renge Kyo is the title of the Lotus Sutra. And um, it is defined in many, many ways. A very simple translation is that Nyo means uh, mystic or wonderful or difficult to fathom. Ho means law. It's the same as the word Dharma in Sanskrit or Dhamma in Pali. Um, Renge means the lotus flower. That's where the title Lotus Sutra um, derives. Um, but it also signifies ren means cause and gay means effect. And the lotus flower symbolizes multiple things. One thing is the idea of the simultaneity of cause and effect and that the lotus both um, blossoms and bears fruit at the same time. It's a very unusual flower. It also um, has a special kind of an oily, waxy substance on it. So it grows out of mud or out of swamps, and yet it comes out without any 
uh, mm -hmm. dirt or filth or mud on it because of this, this special coating that it has. So it represents the, the um, uh, in a sense, kind of like that, that purity of uh, Buddha nature coming out of even the, the muddiness of our, our daily life. So it carries both of those sig um, uh, significances. And then kyo means sutra or teaching. Um, it also is um, understood to mean like a vibration or a sound. So like we say it aloud rather than thinking it um, silently because of that, that vibration of, um, that, that we're uh, in, in a sense connecting with. Thank you. Oh, and Nam, Nam is from the Sanskrit, Namas, you, if you know people from India, you say Namaste. So it's uh, Namas in Sanskrit, and so in, it's a transliteration to Nam, so that it means devotion. So I devote myself to this mystic law of cause and effect or of Buddhahood through the sound of my voice is a very literal translation of it. Thank you. Are you good? We have a few more questions. Sure, of course. Okay. So I did have, um, if nirvana is in this life, is there an afterlife? All right, that's a very good question. That is a question that uh, Shakyamuni, um, as portrayed in the early Buddhist teachings, would not answer. Um, there are many Buddhists who do believe in reincarnation. So afterlife is not exactly in the same sense that you would find within uh, Western-oriented uh, religions. Um, there are Buddhists that talk about Buddhist heaven and Buddhist hell as an intermediate state before you um, are reborn. So there are a variety of Buddhist views. So I don't want to try to pin this down in any one way. Um, I think the um, healthiest way to think about it in the way that uh, Daisaku Ikeda has described it, um, it's comparable to waking and sleeping. So when we're awake, we're active, um, you know, we, we're, we're living our daily life, but then we wear out, we get tired, and we go to sleep, and then we, we get rested, we get rejuvenated, and then we wake up again. And he's described, um, you know, the process or the cycle of life and death in those terms. We don't, in Buddhism, um, believe in, in like a, a, a soul or a unique identity that continues as that same person into some future life. And so the idea is that we create you know, we're a, we're a combination of elements. Let's say we're born into a particular environment, a particular life, a particular society. You know, we draw from that environment. We are influenced by that environment. We age, we get sick, we, we, we die. According to Daisaku Ikeda, that life energy that we have doesn't disappear. That's conservation of energy, even from, from physics. But it blends back into the universe itself, that there is a, a sense that um, the entire universe is connected. There's a, that holism that, or holistic view that was described in that passage I read from him. So our life, in a sense, becomes one with the life of the universe. And if we've created good causes during our lifetime, if we have awakened this Buddha nature, done good things for other people, our life in that time would be a very, you know, peaceful one. If we have created a lot of negativity, harmed people, and done things like that, we may experience suffering in a sense, sort of like nightmares. I mean, you have good dreams and you wake up refreshed. You have nightmares and you wake up exhausted. We can think of life and death sort of that way, but according to the causes and conditions of our own life, then when the time is right and when you know everything is ready, um, in a sense, our life will reappear when it's the right time and place for it to reappear. So it's it's a very different concept. It's one of uh, more of unity with a whole, but we are sort of like that particular instance of it, you know, when we're here active in the world. Hmm. You don't have to believe any of those things. Buddhism is very non-dogmatic. Um, those are the theories. So there is a range of views that Buddhists hold on this topic. Uh, I personally do like the way that Daisaku Ikeda explained it. I think it's the one that, for me, um, comports most with, with what I feel and what I've, I've drawn from the Buddhist tradition. So which leads me into a huge question that somebody presented, and it's, it's multiple question in one. Okay. So when does human life begin? When does it end? And then do you have positions on euthanasia and abortion? Big subjects for, you know, yeah, no, society. Those, those, are, those are huge. And I recognize that these are extremely sensitive subjects. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll go back to the point. I, I mean, there's two things that I would say. One is that, that um, and especially in our form of Buddhism, um, we, we, view human dignity and human life as sort of like absolute. I mean, they're, other than in, in self-defense, um, protecting life, um, we normally do not uh, support the taking of life um, and, um, you know, in fact, would, would speak out uh, strongly against that. 
So we do not um, have anybody that's in the role like, you know, the Pope is within the Catholic faith, for example, that can make a pronouncement like life begins at conception or anything else like that. I would say in general, based on things Daisaku Ikeda has said, that Buddhism would very much be against euthanasia in most settings. Um, as long as there is life, there is hope of change and transformation. But once again, someone that's faced with a, a very, very severe um, illness, uh, very debilitating, who maybe wants to make that choice, there is nothing in Buddhism that would say that they could not do that. That would be a personal choice. We wouldn't condemn somebody for making that, even though we would try to encourage them to use their Buddhist practice to transform that. Um, regarding abortion, I would say sort of for the same reason that um, there might be exceptions for taking human life um, or engaging in violence if it's done to protect others, I would say that in cases where a, you know, a woman has been harmed or is facing um, a health condition and that the um, you know, childbirth would, would put her at risk, um, then I would say that that would probably be a case that, that I think anyone that practices Buddhism would be uh, comfortable with. Um, abortion as a um, you know, way out of an unpleasant situation or an accident. Um, once again, this would be a, a personal choice. Um, I think just using the general guideline, you know, not unnecessarily harming or taking the lives of others, um, I think that would be the encouragement that each person would be you know, asked to, to make the decision that they feel um, is appropriate for them. That the, the wisdom of Buddhism has some flexibility in it. I, there are certain circumstances and times and places where maybe something would, would make, make sense or be appropriate that it might not in another setting or set of circumstances. And so we, we don't make rigid pronouncements on things like that, but we do say that whatever action you're contemplating, please do it from the perspective of, of treasuring human life. And if that's your foundation, then, um, you know, use your best wisdom as to what, you know, what to do. So I hope that answered the question. I know it wasn't a, maybe a satisfying answer, but that's sort of what we, we wrestle with, so. I think many of us wrestle with those things. I have um, a question and then uh, I have a couple of others from um, Rabbi. So, but I have a question because I didn't hear you mention it. I've heard in the Buddhism paths that there's an eightfold path. Yes. So how does your faith stand on that? So um, the eightfold path is a traditional Buddhist teaching. Um, we do not actually um, emphasize it. Um, certainly it's something that we can um, refer to, it talks about things like, you know, right conduct, right action, uh, things of that sort. I, I mean, they're good as general guidelines, but um, in reality, putting them into practice in day-to-day uh, -day modern life, it doesn't always give you a clear answer on what to do. So that's why uh, in our teaching, relying on that inner wisdom that you get from doing the practice is really the key. So so uh, we will, at time to time, you know, look at things like, you know, traditional Buddhist doctrines like the Eightfold Path, but it's not, not central to, uh, to what we do. We feel that it, in a sense, is incorporated in the underlying practice we do and the underlying um, reliance on wisdom that we use in our practice. And so that really is more of an emphasis for us um, than specifically adhering to, you know, the 12 link chain of causation, the Eightfold Path, you know, the, even the Four Noble Truths. Those things are not... Mm -hmm. um, they're part of the underlying Buddhist background, but they're not critical to the actual engagement with our, with our practice. Thank you. So Mike, uh, Rabbi Mike did ask, how much of a meeting is chanting? And then he has another question. How much of a meeting? Mm -hmm. How much of your meetings as a group or on Zoom now are oh, chanting? On Zoom. Oh, so on Zoom, we don't actually chant together on Zoom. It uh, doesn't work very well. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's been viewed as something that's a little bit awkward and almost a little bit strange. So um, our normal like our normal discussion meetings, like the one that you saw there, it's very common. The meeting will last about an hour. We might chant for maybe 10 minutes of that. Now, that part of our chant, you did not see it in the video. We also recite portions of two chapters from the Lotus Sutra. They are done with the same Japanese pronunciation of the Chinese translation, once again, because it is a more chantable version of it. So that takes about five minutes. And we do that in the morning and in the evening. And so we'll do that. We'll chant Namu Horenga Kyo for maybe five minutes. So 
10 minutes total chanting, and then the rest of it will be uh, discussion. We might have a specific mm -hmm. study topic. People might share experiences they had. Um, we always try to have somebody available to answer questions, um, just to generally engage in dialogue. I mean, that's really what the emphasis of our meetings is. So thank you. And this next question makes a lot of sense to uh, many of us in the, um, you know, our, our world of Judaism or Christianity. Are there life cycle rituals? Um, so in traditional Asian forms of Buddhism, there are many life cycle rituals. Um, we um, have at times had some of those kind of widely used in the United States, but especially after we separated from the priesthood, uh, most of those kind of went to the wayside. So we do not have bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs. Um, we do have a lot of uh, special activities for younger people. We do have sort of like mini graduations if you move from middle school to high school or high school, graduate high school. I mean, we'll, we'll do acknowledgments for that, but we don't do like big, you know, blowout parties or anything else like that. Um, the amount of uh, ceremony regarding um, memorial services for the deceased um, is relatively light in the U.S. We'll get, you know, people that knew the person will get together. We do have a ceremony that we will do. I conducted many of those where you'll, um, you know, do the chanting. We'll do, you know, some kind of a format for that person. In Japan, where they have a lot more of the, the whole Buddhist cultural baggage that goes along with that, they do a series of one year, three year, five year, seven year, uh, 12 year, 30. I mean, there's a whole series of, of memorial services that they do for the deceased. But that really reflects Japanese culture and that whole tradition they had of, of emphasizing those types of rituals. Um, but in this country, um, we, we, we sort of minimize that. We will do a memorial service typically when someone passes, but uh, we don't emphasize doing, you know, repeated ones year after year after year. Um, it's very flexible in India. Um, you know, we have a lot of, of SGI members there. I think we're becoming one, probably the largest Buddhist group in India. Um, but the members there can still participate in, in Hindu temple festivals, for example. So, oh, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, variety that you would probably see country by um, country. Um, but yes, we, we have things that we commemorate, that we honor, but we don't have um, a big emphasis on life cycle type rituals. So that leads to the question of, I know that Buddhists of Zen and other uh, type Buddhists have home altars. Yes. Do you have, a, do the Nichiren Buddhists have home altars? Yes, we do have home altars. Um, you saw in that um, video a little bit of a side angle on somebody that were ringing a bell. And mm -hmm. yes, so we, we do not use um, statues or um, uh, paintings or anything like that. We do use what's called a mandala. Um, it is a scroll that basically has uh, representative characters from the Lotus Sutra on it. They represent the 10 different life conditions that I was talking about. Um, and the idea of it is to use it as like a, a, a focal object. Um, but because the Lotus Sutra itself is viewed um, as, as representing um, a, the Buddhist enlightenment in a sense, that by using that as an object, it's meant to help activate that condition within. An, an analogy I heard that I think is very useful is like a a piano and a pianist. A piano is an external object. It has, you know, thousands of years of technology inside of it. It's crafted in a certain way, but by itself, it does nothing. Pianist has a subjective potential developed over years of, you know, practice and developing the craft, but the pianist needs an object to bring out that inner potential. And so when you fuse the two together, the piano and the pianist, you create beautiful music that can uplift everyone's spirits, but you need both of those objects together. And so the, we view what we do as sort of similar terms. The Gohonzon sort of like embodies, the Gohonzon is what the scroll is called. It embodies this um, sense of the thousands of years of Buddhist history within it, representative of the inner Buddha nature that all people have. But then by doing the chant with that subjective potential we have, that actually helps activate the Buddha nature. So that's the way it, it's viewed. So. It is, a, um, it is an abstract representation of our own Buddha nature. It is not viewed as an as a external deity or, or um, um, you know, worship object or something like that. But, but yes, it is used, it is part of, our, um, part of our practice. Interesting. 
And so is there a focus on studying sacred texts? And if so, what language? Yes, so, um, so we, um, our main focus is studying the writings of Nietzscheen. Um, uh, Nietzscheen um, left over a thousand letters and they have all been translated into English. So we're able to study them in English. Um, in Japan, they still um, often use them in uh, the original writing. Uh, the language has shifted over eight centuries. So I've had Japanese people tell me that the English versions we have are actually much easier to read. Uh, Nietzsche cites many um, Buddhist scriptures in his works. Um, we do have translation of the Lotus Sutra. Um, people are certainly welcome to read other Buddhist materials if they wish to, but our primary emphasis is reading uh, the writings of Nietzsche. Uh, those, in a sense, would be our sacred texts. Um, reading the Lotus Sutra for those that choose to. And then we also write, rely uh, heavily on the um, uh, writings of uh, Daisaku Ikeda. Um, he has done a, a great deal of uh, work in bringing um, uh, early Buddhist concepts, um, uh, you know, things that maybe were historically affected by conditions in Japan into the modern world. He's uh, tried to bring in a lot of Western philosophy, um, um, you know, drawn from different cultures around the world to try to make it more understandable and accessible to people. So um, I would say those are probably our primary Sources of uh, Daisaku Ikeda's writings are not considered like scripture. I would say Nichiren's writings probably would be equivalent to scripture. And uh, the Buddhist uh, texts themselves, especially the Lotus Sutra, would also fall into that category. Nice. Do we have any more questions? Okay. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll ask one live. I, I, I got the impression, I think it was covered in the video, that uh, a lot of Buddhism focuses on on the distinction between sort of expectations of life and the idea of reducing your expectations so you won't be disappointed. I thought I got the message from the video that that's not part of of, of SGI. And uh, you, you you are correct that that idea that um, that the desire is bad or wrong and mm -hmm. that it needs to be killed and that by killing desire then you'll be free of desire. That is more the earlier traditional forms of, of Buddhism that, that emphasize that. Um, uh, Nichiren's teaching and the practice of Soka Gakkai does not go down that path. It says that um, there is a oneness between the material and spiritual aspects of life, um, that um, even material things can have a spiritual value. So for example, let's say a, a car, um, it's a material thing. You might want a car because it gives you prestige or you might want a car because it helps you go out and do useful things as a, a volunteer or as an employee, whatever it is that you do, or take your kids to school. So, so the car itself would be viewed as neutral. It's what use do you put it to, um, and do you create value from that? That's why this idea of value creation is very important within Soka Gakkai. That was the initial um, idea behind it being formed as a separate um, separate group. So. So yes, yeah, so we tell people that they can chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo for whatever they would like to have. Certainly aspects of our life are spiritual. We feel uh, inner suffering, angst, uh, questions about the meaning of life. We can chant to try to resolve those inner aspects. But we also might have material needs. We might be suffering from, from poverty. We might have a, a, a drug abuse problem. We might have this, that, and the other thing and actually use the chanting in order to help realize those things. So. Daisaku Ikeda has explained it in terms of the, the greater self and the lesser self. So the lesser self would be like the, the id or the small ego in a sense. That, that is all wrapped up in its own needs, its own want, its own desire. Our form of Buddhism does not deny that, but it says it's a very limited view of the human being and that the, the greater ego, the greater self, is what we're moving towards when we get in the higher life conditions, the bodhisattva realm, the Buddha realm, we're actually awakening that greater sense of our connectedness to all other life. The fact that uh, your happiness and my happiness are not different. You know, we, we, if, if everyone in society is happy, we will all live happier lives. I mean, that we have that close connection and relationship mm -hmm. with each other. Um, to me, this COVID thing has been a, a, a great example. I mean, probably decisions that were made by maybe 100 people or, or neglect committed by maybe 100 people. I'm just throwing this number out there. I don't know what the real number is. But there were specific decisions made by specific people or certain neglectful actions that were taken to turn this thing into a global pandemic. 
every one of us is affected by that. So that's how closely linked our lives are with people we don't even know. Now, if everyone had that, you know, devotion to protecting human life, that devotion to caring for others, regardless of whether they're Buddhist or another faith or no faith, but that put that value for human life at a higher scale, then we would live in a world where people would, would think about their actions that way. They would, would be more considerate that way. And that's sort of why we say that for you, if, if you're suffering poverty, if you don't have a job, if your kids are hungry, if you're suffering whatever, for you to use your practice in order to help solve that problem within your life, that's a good thing. That's better. We will all be better off if you're able to do that. So that is the, the STI view, that the girl that was the cellist, she wanted to really play. Well, her disappointments and her setback, rather than saying, oh, I shouldn't want that, it's wrong, it's not good to have that desire. Instead, gosh, I need to improve my own craft. I need to challenge myself a little bit more, get just a little bit better to, to really convey that beautiful music that I want to share with other people. So there's nothing wrong with that desire if it's being carried out to, to benefit others, to help others, to create beauty or meaning or, or purpose you know, for, for others. So that's how we view it, that you start from wherever you are in the Buddhist practice, but that as you continue it, hopefully as your life expands and deepens, you begin to think more and more in terms of how your life affects others, how you can impact others in a positive way. And so that, that is why those two different aspects of what we do are connected to each other. It's not about killing your desires, it's about developing them in a way that they create more value, more meaning, bring you more happiness and also contribute to the happiness of others. Yeah. Wow, that is a good way to end. Do you have anything else you would like to share, Mick? I would just like to say thank you, Terry. Thank you um, um, to everyone that uh, participated in this. Tim, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure for those of you that I've interacted with over the years, and um, I hope that we get to see each other again sometime. But uh, I'm yes. signing out, so thank you so much. Appreciate well, it. Well, don't, don't go away, everybody. So just a minute. But thank you, Mick. We really, really appreciated this. And you really took the questions. So I want to thank you for that. Thank um, that was questions. very interesting and very informative, as, as well as the video and the slides. So honey, can you post up the screen? Because we are going to have a forum in September. That is the next month. And the forum will be, again, the meaning of life. But we will have, we did that in July. But this time, we're going to have three other faiths. And they would be the um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Unitarian Universalists, and Islam. And I don't have the names up there right now, but I know that all three are going to be women speakers. So for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it will be Catherine Blickenstaff. The Unitarian Universalists will be Betty Stapleford, Reverend Be Betty Stapleford. And for Islam, it will be Shanaz. Ali, and um, they are all dear to my heart, and I think you will find this very interesting to come and visit with them. And then in October, we will go back to visiting with one type of faith to understand them more fully and be able to ask questions, and that will be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, oh, and I am to remind you that to find out about all of our events, please go to www.vcic.info. That's vcic.info. And um, if you have other people who'd be interested, please share. Anybody? Um, and and most, people, most, people, most people are muted. So if you want to say something, you'll need to unmute yourself. Yes. And for anybody I know and didn't say hi to, I apologize, like Karen King and Craig Fisher and Bobby. Hi to all of you. Hi to the people I haven't met. It's great to have you. Lynn and Rose. Hello. Hello. Is that uh, Bobby? Yes. Hi. <laughs> hi. And Karen King. So it was good to have everybody and hope to see you again in September. We'll this, be there. This has been an exciting thing to me to be able to do this. And Terry, what's the date again in September? I believe it is September 24th, and I think okay. I got it right this time. And somebody. And has, will we have a meeting the week before? 
we will have a meeting just to make sure everything goes well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank Mick, you. Mick, Mick, just not, not necessarily part of, part of the whole discussion, but just as an afterthought, it just struck me how similar some of the ideas you presented were to Jewish mysticism, to Kabbalah. This idea of the oneness of everything is definitely a Kabbalistic idea. And for those of you, you know, interested in the Hebrew scripture, it comes out of Deuteronomy when it says God is one because of the openness of the Hebrew language. One can also mean unity. So the mystics take it in that direction. They also embrace the idea of, of uh, reincarnation rather than resurrection. So there's a lot of commonalities, I think. It's, I, find, I find it fascinating. Yeah, it, it might not be a coincidence. There was a lot of cultural exchange in that part of the world that is not always so well considered. The, uh, mm -hmm. the Parthians spread from the Levant all the way over to Northern India. So um, there, there was a lot going on. So yes, mm -hmm. there some connections there. Interesting. I was mentioning to Mick yet last night when we were practicing, there's a famous uh, uh, story in Christianity called the story of the prodigal son. And there's a beautiful rendition of that in the Lotus Sutra. And uh, I've been so impressed with the two. And we were talking about uh, where that originated and whether it originated in one tradition or the other. And I think the consensus Mick and I had is we don't know, but it's a beautiful story. And uh, I liked the, uh, for the Christians in the audience, I like the fact that uh, one of the things in the Buddhist scripture that's different than in the Christian is that the uh, uh, father sets the son to digging dung, uh, clearing up a dung pile uh, to prepare him for his role as a, as a uh, landowner and as a, I think as a king in the Buddhist scripture, if I remember right, Mick, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, because he sees his son suffering there in doing that, the father actually goes out and starts to uh, shovel dung with the son. And I just love that um, little sort of addition to the Christian scripture that the Lotus Sutra adds. Yeah, I'll be honest, I don't remember exactly what, what the guy's status was, but yes, he, he goes and he's worried about his son and he goes, he's afraid his son will get discouraged. Then he goes out and disguises himself and works side by side with him. So yeah. yeah. Very nice. There's a, a, a rabbinic story which says when, when, when the Israelites were driven out of the, out of the Holy Land, the temple is destroyed, you know, they go into exile. And they said it's a, a parable of a king who, because his son has sinned against him, sends his son into exile. But because he is so fond of his son, he goes into exile with his son. So therefore, you know, God goes into exile with the, with the Israelites, with the Jewish people, uh, and doesn't stay at the, the temple site. Sort of a similar idea. <laughs> Very similar. Well, thank you, everybody.